All right, well, we're going to get started. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for attending today. This is our virtual morning business under the Big Tent event. I'm uh, Elizabeth Kaplan. I'm the chair of economic development. I'd like to introduce you to a few people that are um, on our EDC and also uh, you know, our guest speakers for today. Unfortunately, our, our guest speaker, Senator Needleman, could not make it today. He is the chair of the Energy Committee up in Hartford, and he's dealing with the fallout from the storm. So he had a meeting he had to attend, but we're hopeful in the future he will be able to attend. Uh, I'd like to, if you don't already know Roger, Roger Solway, our Economic Development Coordinator. Good, we have morning. Good morning. And then we have Mike Paulus, our Town Manager. Good morning. And we have some members of the Economic Development Commission. We have Kim Dawson. Good morning. Oops. We have Joan Tudor. And we have Jan Finch. And I see, uh, I see Senator Christine Cohen just got on today. And our guest speakers today will be Mike Paulus. He will give us a little update on the town, how we're doing, how the town has, uh, you know, reacted with COVID and on numerous other things. He'll give us a little state of the town update. And our main speaker today will be Marsha LaFemina. She is the owner and CEO of Penn Globe. She is a, an advocate for, with um, the uh, workforce for skills building. And she will discuss uh, today challenges and working at a small business, especially the climate that we're in. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Mike. And I think at the end, if you have any questions or if you have any questions during any of the presentations, uh, please feel free to ask. Um, thank you so much for attending. Great, thank you, Liz, and good morning, everyone. I'm Mike Paulus, I'm the town manager for North Brantford, and I thank you all for joining us this morning uh, for this uh, vir virtual meeting on, on manufacturing and uh, the state of the town. And I, I'll be brief uh, to try and get through, because uh, I think we've got a lot of good stuff uh, that Marsha can cover for us, and I hope that we'll have a, a very uh, you know, interactive exchange in terms of questions, because um, I think it's important, and I'm glad we had this uh, opportunity to, to do it at, at least virtually. Um, and I'm going to set up and, and start with uh, you know, the, the state of the town, and, and of course, um, since I last spoke, at, you know, at the beginning of the year, uh, we, we've witnessed and, you know, the breakout of a significant medical crisis uh, that's just changed the way we do business. Uh, I think we all recognize that. And, and we've been dealing with the devastating effects of a worldwide pandemic and COVID-19. So, uh, you know, in this new reality, uh, you know, we're, we're forced to make changes in how we deliver uh, services and how we conduct our, our public business. Uh, from a local government perspective, uh, you know, I think we've adapted well and, and we continue to do so as we plan for the, you know, the uncertainty, the uncertain world ahead. Um, but the, the town, you know, will continue to modify its strategy with respect to, you know, communication, uh, access for residents and, and businesses alike. So, you know, through uh, COVID-19, um, you know, we, we've been uh, pretty diligent uh, about working with our East Shore uh, health department and uh, Mike Pascasil and his staff have been absolutely uh, tremendous in, in getting us through this. And, and you know, we, we've pretty much been steady uh, since the beginning of the pandemic uh, in terms of our cases. We've been steady with a, with a low level. Uh, right currently, uh, we're at 92 since the, since the pandemic uh, began. And we, we've sort of flatlined and, and, and been uh, pretty steady about that with not a lot of new cases, which is great. It's a great indicator. But, you know, there was a great, uh, um, you know, urgency in terms of need and getting, um, you know, PPE and equipment uh, ordered, uh, modifications, uh, and just like every, you know, not just town hall, but 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 all of us in this together and uh, working with Roger and, and the Economic Development Commission to get information out about the PPP uh, loan program and trying to help businesses, you know, making modifications for uh, restaurants and, and dining and, and, and so forth. So, um, you know, we, 
it's been tough. I, I get it. And, and, uh, but I think we've got a great team. We've got a great community. We've all pulled together. Uh, we've done a great job and, and, and we've got so much more to do uh, and we'll continue to do that. So, uh, you know, I hope that uh, businesses see us as a, as a resource, as a, as a team that you can rely on and to get answers, to get information, uh, to get resources. So we'll, we'll continue to do that. And again, it's, a, it's been a team effort. Um, as, as far as the, uh, the town, I'd like to, you know, to maybe talk a little bit about uh, where we are uh, from a, you know, a fiscal standpoint, and uh, we're, we're pretty healthy. And, and this moment in time, you know, our, our annual audit has, has been positive, uh, confirming our status as a you know, stable fiscal uh, municipality. We're, we're stable fiscally. We're in good shape. Uh, Standard & Poor's has reaffirmed our, our bond rating at AA+. Uh, which is a strong, uh, solid rating for a town of our size. Um, our fund balance is healthy. Uh, we've had continuing um, um, uh, uh, percentages that, that are well above what the, our auditors uh, recommend for our, our fund balance, which is, which is good. Our pensions are appropriately uh, uh, funded uh, based on recommendations from, from our actuary. Uh, so in that sense, we're, we're doing well. Um, you know, so from a financial management standpoint, uh, right now, picture looks stable, picture looks good. Um, but we also, you know, from an economic standpoint, just want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the attractions uh, and some of the tools that we've used. The uh, I, I've mentioned before, and we've talked about the assessment deferral program has helped businesses expand their operation, and our grand list is. Uh, is has some growth, not as much as, as we like, or some, not as much as some of our surrounding towns. But as a small town, we we do the best we can uh, with with the with the grand list and uh, with the economic development commission's efforts and Rogers' efforts. Uh, we're doing okay. We're holding our own. Um, so. You know, we try to obviously look at that agro tourism niche and, and see if we can not exploit that. And we're, we're trying to do that. And I think, you know, we're, we're a great town. I think, you know, North Brantford has this great uh, mix, you know, agriculture and, and manufacturing. And, and that's what I'm interested in hearing uh, Marsha's comments about manufacturing, because I think it's a great opportunity for us. And along the lines of the agro tourism um, theme, uh, we've got, uh, as you know, a Mill Pond Tavern Rehabilitation Project up on Route 17. It's looking pretty good uh, with a targeted opening, I think, for uh, 2021. And uh, that'll be a farm to table operation, which will obviously add to our growing attractions. And, um, you know, the farm trail brochure has been, has been successful for us and, and attracting folks to the Rose uh, Vineyard and Winery, DeFrancesco's Farm Brewery. Um, so, you know, we're, we're building, well, there's some building blocks there. And I think we, we continue to, to showcase that along with obviously a, a very uh, successful sunflower program. And, and thanks to a bunch of volunteers and, and, and Larry Auger and, and uh, also uh, Mark DeLungo and funding it uh, this year uh, kind of puts us on the map and gives us something unique to talk about and attract people. And, uh, you know, along with the destination North Brantford, uh, I think we're starting to pull it all together and we're starting to find our groove. And, and I think uh, we're doing a pretty good job at trying to market that and get the word out. So we'll continue to do that. And, uh, you know, we're also good at weathering storms. So, you know, th this latest tropical storm, again, kind of showcase the, uh, the team approach um, you know, to having the, you know, the need to have a good team to have good partners, uh, you know, as we, you know, help businesses and, and help residents get through these difficult times. And, and when I say team, you know, I'm talk talking from, from Roger and the Economic Development Commission members that are so passionate about what they do and, and getting in there to our partnerships with, with Honeywell, Tilcon, RWA, Evergreen Woods, you know, Big Y, the Sports Complex, uh, the Ice Pavilion, ESI, Penn Globe, our farmers, you know, many, many other small uh, businesses and, uh, and, and folks uh, that are on the call today in this, in this virtual meeting, you know, that makes uh, the community great. So I think there's a great story to tell here. We're, we're strong, you know, 
from a fiscal standpoint, from a management standpoint, and uh, from an economic standpoint. I, I think we're starting to pull it all together. And, uh, you know, we've got administrators working on it, trying to assist businesses in their development, focused on, focus on strengthening the partnerships, developing uh, initiatives, things like the uh, Sustainable Connecticut Renewable Energy. Uh, so we're doing some great things there with uh, obviously uh, a, a application um, that I believe uh, you know, we're, we're looking at a bronze level, uh, so I don't think there's any reason to suspect that we won't achieve that. And I think we, I, I, preliminary, I think we have that. Um, so that's fantastic. Um, you know, so, a solar energy project with citrine power and a virtual net metering project that uh, is underway and, and we'll be negotiating uh, uh, on that contract. And hopefully, you know, if all goes well, that, that, that can uh, come to fruition as well. So a lot of, uh, you know, really interesting things going on and uh, in economic development and in a small town like ours that we're very, I'm very pleased with. And I think the EDC is pleased with and, and uh, we'll continue to work on those initiatives and really uh, spearhead new ones, I'm sure. But um, again, today we're talking about, uh, you know, the potential that exists in developing other uh, partnerships and, and career pathways in advanced manufacturing, which I think is, um, you know, an unprecedented opportunity for us when you think of a, you know, a small town like ours to be able to be part of that discussion uh, in North Brantford, because I think we have a very uh, good solid core of manufacturers and I think it opens up the doorway and pathways uh, to careers for our, our students and, and young, uh, young adults uh, that may not be uh, ready for a four-year college uh, pathway. So um, with that, I, you know, I, I'll wrap up and because and, uh, I am interested in, in hearing from Marsha and certainly uh, would welcome any questions anyone has uh, about uh, the town and, and our, uh, our state of the town, as we say at this point. So I'll I guess open it up to uh, any questions before I, I give it back to, to Liz. Mike, this is Roger. You might just want to uh, highlight the fact that we learned last week that Honeywell now has 900 full-time employees in North Brantford, and two years ago that was 450. Yeah, great. Thank you, Roger. Yeah, great, great story uh, to tell in terms of, you know, one of the pillars of economic development in terms of, or, you know, the, the, uh, the concept of uh, retention and expansion. And so they're leading the way for us. And, and that's, uh, that's a great story as well to tell. And, uh, you know, I hope we, we can do help more companies do the same and continue to do that with our, uh, you know, assessment deferral or, or our just in our, our partnership and in, in looking at, uh, you know, um, utility rates and, and, and just looking at uh, a bunch of other uh, aspects of business uh, development to make us attractive and uh, to make, for, you know, for businesses that want to stay. We also, we have some, some smaller um, development projects uh, that uh, from municipal standpoint that I didn't mention and could that we're, we're very busy right now uh, with a, a new police department um, that uh, will move uh, and expand our operation there and improve our uh, efficiency with respect to both the facility and telecommunications with uh, radio equipment. Um, so we have that underway and, and, a, and a high school uh, project that's underway. So two major uh, projects that go to sort of to the uh, community uh, development, if you will, and the strengthening of, uh, of the community. So a lot going on here in, in North Brantford. And as Roger said, uh, you know, our friends at Honeywell uh, are, are doing great and it's a great story to tell. Thanks, Mike. Any questions for Mike? I also wanted to welcome, I see uh, State Rep uh, Vinnie Candelora is on the call. Thank you so much for attending. And again, thank you, Christine, for being here today. It's great to have both of you. I wanted to give a shout out to Bonnie Szymanski. Uh, she spearheaded the Sustainable Connecticut um, application. It was a lot of work and it also dovetails with our plan of conservation and development to have these kinds of projects in town. And also I wanted to talk about our quickly, our, um, our partnership with the, uh, the land trust. 
and they have done an amazing job of creating trails in the town and are really dedicated to land preservation. So if you have an opportunity to uh, you know, use any of their, their pieces, please feel free to do so. It's a great, they're wonderful. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce Marsha LaFemina, and she is going to talk with us about manufacturing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to open up by saying I'm a better uh, talker than I am a speaker, so let's just put that in perspective. So if we can just make pretend this is like a conversation rather than a lecture, it would be better for me. Um, for those of you that don't know me, um, we manufacture streetlights um, here in North Brantford. Um, small company, woman-owned, trying to do big things um, in a, in, from a very small capacity. We're only like 13 people right now. But um, in the midst of everything that's been going on, we were able to stay profitable and stay healthy and things look you know, in this, whatever this new normal is going to look like for us, things are looking, you know, okay. Now, knock on wood. Um, but personally, I find myself in a situation of trying to keep my eye on what we all need to be looking at as small business owners for the, you know, the opportunities and the funding and, and the like that's available for us, plus try to stay on point with the directions that manufacturing was moving in this state before, before March. Um, the governor had put a lot of effort in my view of wrapping his arms around the manufacturing issue uh, with the um, introduction of the uh, Connecticut Manufacturing Collaborative, which if I'm, if I'm at all way being redundant, let me just say I apologize for what you guys already know, but uh, bringing in Colin Cooper, trying to you know, come up with some kind of statewide version and vision. But meanwhile, there's all these individual groups out there all trying to do things from a workforce point of view. Um, so there's a lot, there was a lot going on and now everybody is looking to regroup. So I just wanna go back and talk about money first. Um, we were able to get the PPP money. We also got the um, Economic um, Injury Disaster Loan Funds and we turned down the bridge loan from the state. I say that as an example about if people will keep their eyes regardless of what industry they're in, their eyes and their ears open, there, there are resources out there. Um, Christine could probably speak to this better than I can, but there are two programs now, the Skill Up Connecticut, or Skill Up Connecticut program, which is basically a self-learning tool that's available to anyone in the state at any time, but is particularly focused on those people who are um, unemployed at this time to build up skills. It's a program that's called Metrics Learning that has been in the state reservoir at the, res at the um, workforce uh, boards at least for seven years. And it's something like three or 5,000 classes. Some are certified, some are just improvement. It's everything from how to weld to how to send an office email. And they resurrected that. So it's a good resource for people to spend their time if they're in transition. And then meanwhile, there's also the um, the skills, skills 180 manu for manufacturing and workforce training, which directly brings together training that manufacturers are looking for. And these programs are available for incumbent workers. I'm sorry, I'm having a new septic system installed in my backyard as I sit here talking to you also. I apologize for the distraction and the noise. Um, so these are great resources that are out there. People should keep their eyes and ears open for the next round of funding that comes from the federal government. I do believe the EIDL money is still available. Um, I don't know, Christine, am I right about that? Is that still available? I believe it is. But, um, and then there's also the uh, small SBA Express for $25,000 to help people out is also still available. Yeah, um, well, I'll, I'll just, sorry, I couldn't get off mute fast enough. Your, yep. uh, the PPP funding, there's still uh, PPP funds available uh, through uh, some of the local banks and uh, Vinny can probably add to this as well. There are still a couple of SBA programs if you go through SBA Connecticut for some of those uh, federal lending programs. So um, these are things that I think that um, if everyone keeps in mind, checks in regularly with SBA, checks in regularly with CCAT, who up in Connecticut, the Connecticut Center for Advanced Technology, 
um, they're the ones, I, I believe they're administering the, um, the 180 program for DECD. So I believe that the, what I'm trying to say is, is I believe the state is trying to stay focused on the manufacturing wraparound that they were trying to do pre-COVID with some, some changes along the way, because now we still have many, many manufacturing jobs that are still available and how to train potentially um, dis dislocated workers from the COVID and get them the training so those jobs can marry up, I think is a work in process. And we need to keep our eyes on that and see what might be able to come. I think also there will also be initiatives around um, equity and diversity and inclusion in the manufacturing space that are also going to be things that we're going to keep our, keep our eyes on. Things to be concerned about are things that we've all been concerned about in the manufacturing space, which is um, potential liability, workman's comp liability due to COVID. Uh, and it's, it's beginning to become a real conversation and I don't know what's going to happen with that. Many of us were, as employers, but certainly manufacturers, you can't work remotely. You have to stay open, you have to, you have to work and setting all that up, doing the best you can. And initially the guidelines were all from, from uh, OSHA were only for the flu because not for what we were in. And it's, it's, that, is, that, is, that is potentially a, a problem down the road for, for us. Um, I don't know if anyone else has, wants to speak to that concern from any other industries, but that is a big concern for all of us what might happen there. So um, anyway, we want to keep our eyes and ears on that because the comp issue is extremely fuzzy. And I wonder that we don't want to talk from this from the town's point of view, Roger, with Manufacturing Day is October 2nd. It's a national um, recognition of manufacturing. And I don't know if there's not something that we want to put together to highlight and showcase what it is that we're what we're doing in some kind of virtual perspective. Sure, let's get together on that. Okay. Um, maybe it's our success stories during COVID, maybe it's where we're going, maybe it's Honeywell, I don't know, but there might be something we might want to think about. Sure. What's that date again, Marsha? It's always, it's, well, October is, is Manufacturing Month, but Manufacturing Day is always the first Friday in October, which is October 2nd this year. Okay. Um, I would also encourage people on the National Association for Manufacturers in Washington, which is basically, you know, lobbying. Um, they're they're a, an excellent resource for what is happening for Manufacturing Day. They have um, educational it, uh, departments, but they're also good from the legal part. They're the ones who are working on the work. Workman's comp issue. They were the first place that I found. Oh, we're all eligible, no matter what business you are. We're all going to be eligible for a fifty percent credit for any monies that we've spent relative to COVID in our businesses, from having to buy extra paper towels to doing a deep clean of your facility. So that's something to before it gets away from all of us. We might want to, um, you know, start compiling that that list so you have it. Because um, I know we spent a ton of money, you know, deep cleaning and that kind of stuff. So I don't know if any of that is helpful, but that's where we are. It's a lot of things from a lot of different resources federally and here in the state. So I have a question, Marsha. How has, how has your company changed over time since COVID started? Like what have you done to make sure you're able to get your products out on time and work with your employees and all that? Well, fear was the biggest thing, to be honest with you, Liz. I mean, it was absolutely the biggest thing. We were just afraid, even though we were considered essential from the get-go, didn't know how long that would last. I mean, right? I mean, essential is, there were different definitions of it. So we just started shipping out everything that wasn't nailed to the floor. If we could get it out in four weeks rather than our usual six, we did that to make sure we had some decent cash reserves being built. Um, but uh, in the meantime, our supply chain, it was a little bumpy in the beginning because people were afraid of crossing lines. We've also found delivering into states was a problem because we might be ready to, to ship it, but we couldn't take it into Massachusetts because they had shut down construction. So it was you know, the risk that you're making something and sitting on the floor for four weeks, which happened, you know. but by and large, 
we're pretty much on target with where we were last year. I hear these supply chain stories, but I think it's things like plastics because a lot of the raw materials are being used for PPP and, and other COVID safeguards. I don't really think it's much, I don't think it's much more than that, but I, I, I could be wrong. But um, I think we went the extra mile to keep our, our people safe. Everybody is, you know, six feet apart all times, you know, gators on when you're walking from wherever it is you're walking. And um, but knock on wood, we're healthy. So. How do you, how are your customers faring? Well, that's the big question because for me personally, half of my business is municipalities and the other half is colleges and universities, both of which have been extremely affected. Their budgets have been extremely affected by all this. Right now, I'm working off of, for municipalities, pretty much last year's budgets. You know, I don't know what next year is going to look like when they have to come to the next budget season. Um, we have a, 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 a Princeton is, is, is a big client of ours. And, you know, we have a big project that we are expecting in the first quarter, which is an entire new campus. I mean, I mean an entire new campus. It, will that be moving forward? Will that be delayed? You know, I, I think the next six months is going to be really telling. But so far, I'm working off of old information so it, for my customers, so it's not really relative. You know what I'm saying? So that's our story. Does anyone else have questions for Marsha? This is uh, Mike Paulus. Uh, hi, Marsha. Hey, um, I was wondering if you could just kind of elaborate on your um, your product, and, and you talk about municipalities and and uh, campuses and universities and the decorative lighting. But I, I happen to know that you're into uh, security uh, elements as well. How do those two worlds uh, come together? Maybe explain to uh, uh, folks, uh, just to hear a little bit about your um, technology side and the security side of, of bringing those uh, to. One, one second, guys, one second. I'm sorry. Are, are you there? I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. That was the um the septic people coming in to talk to me. So sorry. Um. Yeah, from the how the how the two worlds come together with the uh, with the lighting and the uh, and the uh, security. Well, I mean, there's security all over the place. Just so everyone knows, we see cameras everywhere, but. The, the, the genesis of all of this was is that most of the security was way up above the trees and the real information that was important to people would be down at the ground level. Um, you know, being able to see people's faces for what was going, you know, what was transpiring, not just the top of their heads. Many of you have already heard me tell the story about the Boston Marathon. That's when all this started was Boston Marathon. We were watching the videos from the tops of the building and they were seeing the tops of the people's red hats but they needed people's cell phones down the street to be able to identify who those who those folks were that you know set off the bomb there at the World Trade Center. I mean, at the at the marathon. So, long story short, there was an opportunity there. We saw that there was a need, particularly for law enforcement, and so we began introducing cameras. It's got a little bit more aggressive. People now want Wi-Fi, um, which is you know still an not a great application, but there is a place for public address systems, emergency notifications. Um, and we're moving in that way and we're not sure that there's not something there for um, COVID response using the lights too. We're not sure, we're, we're investigating that now, I'll share it, but we're investigating where that can work because most of the reading material for people and their temperatures and whatnot is interior. And we're wondering about large gatherings, how we can be helpful in that space and the outdoor space. So we're exploring that right now. So it's kind of kind of interesting, kind of keep your eyes on what's going on and where the need is, you know, and where the money is right, right now, there's gonna be a lot of COVID money. At the time there was a lot of security money. That makes sense? So that's what we're doing. Marcia, okay. just jumping back in, this is Roger on the appointment of Kelly Valieres now as the 
Director yes. of Workforce Development. Could you mention, perhaps expand on what you understand that operation? Um, sure, the Office of Workforce Competitiveness was part of the Department of Labor and um, recently became under, under the auspices of DECD. And Kelly will be the person who will be responsible for just what it sounds, making, a, making the Connecticut workforce uh, competitive in multiple arenas. Um, she comes with a tremendous background. Those of you that know her, she was, um, my view, single-handedly single responsible for the genesis of the whole initial pipeline program. Um, being a business owner, being a, an educator and putting that all together. She sits on every board and every single commission that there is available relative to manufacturing and workforce. And she's going to be the point person, again, in this wraparound, trying to pull it all together for all, all of the workforce in Connecticut. But of course, she knows manufacturing more than anything else. You want to supplement that, Roger? No, we're delighted. She's probably going to be our guest speaker at our next meeting in November, so. Alan Cooper has relied heavily on her in, in her when he came in, you know, into uh, the picture. And, um, you know, she's, she's a Shoreline resident. Uh, her business is on the Shoreline and uh, we'll be lucky to have her be, you know, there focusing on, uh, for all of us, very lucky. Great, thank you. So uh, I don't know if uh, Christine and Vinny being that you're on the call today, if you can maybe uh, give us a synopsis of what's going on at the state, and you can you can do it in terms of business and manufacturing and or whatever, uh, just what's happening up in Hartford. Just give us a little, you know, update. Sure, Vinny, you want to go first, or yeah, whichever you want. It's fine if you want to. Do you want me to go? Sure, go ahead. Okay, I mean, you know, right now, obviously, um, we are not in regular session. So regular session doesn't start until January. Uh, there is some discussions going on for a special session in September. Um, and I think one of the areas that is being discussed is, um, you know, our electric grid. Uh, and it, at first, we saw some controversy over the electric rate hikes. Um, but now we are seeing issues over storm response. So there's going to be, uh, I think, some discussion in those areas and maybe some legislation in September, although I think the bigger issues are going to need to be um, taken up in January. And, you know, sort of dovetailing that into manufacturing, obviously the electric costs um, are significant for our manufacturers. You know, our family being in manufacturing, it's, it's one of our most um, expensive elements. So we are going to look at procurement in the state of Connecticut, I think, um, and how to make it more affordable. It's sort of a complicated subject, but you heard about the issues of Millstone and um, whether or not, you know, the Millstone deal where Eversource had to procure some of that electricity caused the cost to rise. But I would suggest it's also the way we require um, the electric companies to go back out to bid. So for instance, Millstone, um, sells their electricity to Eversource. Eversource actually sells that back out and then purchases again from the grid. So rather than keeping that electricity uh, at a lower cost potentially and passing that on to ratepayers, they are selling it and then re-procuring it. And it costs ratepayers more money. And I think um, we may be one of the only states that do that. Um, some of the areas I think we need to modify or monitor is just as we're going into this pandemic, we do have another increase to the minimum wage in September. Um, very concerned about our hospitality industry and just trying to help them recover through this. Um, you know, we all worry about a surge coming up in November. How is that gonna impact certain businesses that you know rely on indoor activity, our bars, things of that nature, I think are gonna be topics of conversation as well. And I think with that, I could just turn over to Christine yeah, I, I, you know, that, that all good information. And um, I, I think Vinny's right, you know, we'll, we'll likely be something on uh, utilities in a special session in September. 
Um, you know, North Brantford is uh, split between three utility companies and uh, we saw a vast difference in the response uh, of each of those. Um, but uh, most importantly, we have to figure out um, how to regulate rates. So rate payers are not paying, you know, the, the fourth highest in the nation, uh, which is what Connecticut is right now in terms of util uh, electricity rates, uh, which is just crazy, astronomical, uh, and uh, especially during these times uh, to have these rate hikes is just, um, you know, unthinkable. So we need to do all we can uh, to, um, you know, alleviate some of those burdens that ratepayers are feeling and also address uh, emergency and storm preparedness uh, on the part of the utilities. So I think we'll see uh, some of that coming up. We'll also, Pura, uh, our regulatory authority, uh, utility regulatory authority in Connecticut, uh, has a docket on the Eversource uh, rate increases in particular, and a hearing is scheduled for August 24th. They have a separate hearing uh, that will be scheduled and forthcoming on um, the response to uh, the, this past tropical storm. And we'll also see uh, likely a legislative forum. Um, and I, my understanding is that the Eversource uh, CEO will be present at that. Um, and I believe they've invited uh, uni United Illuminating uh, to the table as well. But um, I think a lot of us could, um, or a lot of the utility companies could really take a page from the book of um, uh, more of the private uh, companies like Wallingford Electric, um, whose responsiveness was uh, phenomenal during the storm. Uh, although some of you without power may, may say differently. Um, but uh, we saw you know, some folks without power upwards of uh, six, seven days um, and, and folks trapped in areas uh, across the 12th district, including in North Brantford, um, you know, uh, and un uh, inaccessible to emergency vehicles. So we need to address these things going forward. I'd also like to, you know, and this is sort of what happens uh, with special sessions and in light of the fact that this pandemic hit uh, during the middle of our short session and uh, committees were unable to get the work completed uh, that they desperately had wanted to. Um, so folks then try and jam everything they can into a, a special session. So you've got committees uh, talking mm -hmm. to leadership uh, in all four caucuses, uh, you know, requesting that their bills be heard uh, and become a part of the agenda. But it would be great in light of everything that's going on to do some sort of economic stimulus. Uh, I too am uh, incredibly concerned uh, for some of the industries across the state of Connecticut, uh, hospitality, catering, as uh, Vinny uh, spoke about, uh, is being per hit particularly hard in light of the fact that uh, large gatherings are still uh, prohibited in the state, uh, certainly to prevent the spread of COVID, which is important, but uh, we need to be mindful that um, some of our industries are really struggling in this time and, um, you know, have, uh, have a, the lower likelihood of survival if we don't get them um, some help. So I'd like to see um, some sort of stimulus um, for small businesses. Uh, you know, in the in Environment Committee, we we're working on the Transfer Act, uh, which was a coordinated effort between environment and commerce, uh, which uh, really could be a, a great economic stimulus as well. So I'd love to see us move forward with some of these things. We've got um, some changes that need to be made to an agricultural uh, bill. Uh, you know, we had created a new cash crop out of the Environment Committee uh, in 2019 with uh, the passage of hemp le legislation. Um, and, um, you know, there's some farms right in North Brantford uh, working on growing hemp. Um, De Francesco being one of them, and we need to um, update that bill in order to. Uh, to have it move forward um, and it really needs to be done um, prior to October actually um, because of some federal changes. So those are things that uh, I'm working on right now and um, you know hope to see uh, come to fruition in a special session in September. 
Thank and you. I just, say, I just want to say thank you um, also for um, having this meeting. I just always find it informative as to what's going on with the town. And, um, you know, Marsha, is, uh, it's great to hear from you and, and uh, what's going on at Penn Globe. And I know um, things, your, your industry is uh, like many others and that, um, you know, trying to figure out ways to uh, make things work in, in light of the, the changes that we've all sort of been experiencing industry to industry. Uh, throughout this pandemic, but um, just want to say thanks um, for for having us because I think it, it really is informative. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Vinny. Uh, excellent updates. And Marsha, your leadership, not only in what you're doing, but your partnership with our community um, has been invaluable. And we really appreciate uh -huh you being here and whatever we can do for you. you I know you and Roger speak regularly and uh, you know, being able to weather a storm like this for any company has its challenges and anyone, you know, everyone that's here today, uh, we are here as your partner. We are here to help you facilitate uh, your business, uh, sustainability, growth, anything. And I know Roger reaches out to businesses on a regular basis and you all have a great uh, relationship with him and we thank you for that open communication. We hope that uh, your constant contact, uh, weekly updates have been helpful, especially during the pandemic. Uh, Roger's been great with, as soon as he gets something from the state, he puts it right out to you and we hope that's been a good resource for you. And let us know if there's other things you want us to do for you as far as, uh, you know, economic development, you know, we're seven volunteers, but we are here to serve the community in the best way that we can. And Mike, thank you for being our partner as well. Um, I was on economic development some years ago, back in 2005, and it didn't have the vita vitality that we have now. And I think that's because of the partnerships that we have in our community and having someone like Roger, um, really work for the town has, has been fantastic. And, uh, you know, we have a great partnership with the Shoreline Chamber and Kim is uh, employed with the chamber and, and we want to continue to see growth. And, um, you know, that's, that's really why we're here. We're here to keep our town sustainable and growing and we're here for all of you. So again, if there's any questions to any of the, you know, Mike or Roger, Marsha, um, our, our uh, legislators, please, please speak now. Uh, Liz, Barbara is on from, from Rex. Is she? Oh. Yep. Go to here. Tell us what's going on. Hi, Barbara. Sure. Um, from the regional level, for those of you who don't know, um, our region goes from Milford to Meriden to Madison. And um, we've always been under the impression that two of our largest sectors, um, healthcare and uh, higher ed, are pretty recession proof. Well, we learned differently this spring. Um, we are concerned for both of them as well as hospitality and leisure. Um, the biggest issue for us moving forward for economic stability is getting the college students back and healthy and not having a resurgence. Um, we've met with the colleges. We know that they have pretty stringent plans in place, but we also saw how quickly it spread um, initially. So we are watching that very carefully. Um, the other issue is the power outage um, overall in our region was not as severe as it was in some other areas. The silver lining for that was um, many of our hotels that had been empty were able to put up crews and people without power. We were not able to get to full occupancy because so many of the workers had been laid off. Um, our friends at Yale jumped in, they housed some people in their dorms, let power companies park in their parking lots. So I think, um, not that Yale hasn't always been a good partner, they have, it's just they've taken on a different role in, in view of the pandemic. So what we're doing is reaching out to all of them. Um, obviously kids are, particularly students, are gonna go out downtown because it's closest. However, it is very hard to maintain social distancing in a city. 
So we are going to be pushing um, people out towards the suburbs and um, other towns so that they can have a different experience here and have a positive experience while you know, maintaining these social distancing rooms. Um, the last thing I would like to add, and this is really what I would have led off with if we weren't in the middle of a pandemic, is um, we do our annual visitor's guide. There are 60,000 printed copies. We distribute them up and down the East Coast. Um, really exciting. And the um, sunflower field is on the cover. Unfortunately, we don't have any visitors. <laughs> So um, it's available online. Um, if anybody needs paper copies, we can set up an appointment to pick them up in our office. The um, upside is it's dated 2021, so we may be able to get some uh, use out of it next year. But um, yeah, I, th I think as a region, we're doing the best we can. Hotels are really suffering. The Omni in New Haven has not reopened yet. It should be opening the beginning of September. Um, nationally, we're not hearing good numbers for hotels, but hopefully we will be able to, you know, make our way through this, build on our strong sectors, you know, that they'll be able to bounce back and um, the region will be okay. Thank you, Barbara. Go ahead, Roger. Um, I think Kim Spanier is on the lines from representing Sherry <laughs> from the local chamber. Is yes, Kim still there? I am still here. How are you? I don't know if Kim Dawson wants to say anything, but um, I'm, yeah, I'm just jumping on, just representing the Shoreline Chamber of Commerce. I'm on the board. I own a small residential remodeling company here in North Brantford. And um, the chamber has really done a great job at trying to shift and pivot what they do to support their members. And, you know, they've uh, immediately, sh shortly, after we, you know, the shutdown back in March, uh, Sherry put together um, a virtual series so that business owners can jump on and have kind of the inside track to um, speak with legislators and, and find out information about the loans. And she did a great job at bringing people, the right people um, to a forum that we could actually just ask questions. So she's done a great job. She's also pivoted and, and put a lot of the networking online. Um, you know, so we're just doing the best. And Kim Dawson did a great job also at, they put together um, Open for Business, a whole section of their website to yeah. really promote all of the businesses that were still there, still operating, finding new ways to make it happen. So the chamber has done a great job to try to market the members, actually not just the members, but local businesses right. to say, hey, we're still here. Don't forget about us. Um, and you know, she, they brought all the resources out. But Kim, did you want to say anything else? Thank you, Kim. Uh, yeah. You know, the only thing I would like to add, especially with all the strong women that we have even on the call today, we have our Women of Excellence coming up um, on October 8th. And the uh, nominees, um, you can nominate uh, a woman of, um, of excellence. Uh, up until I think it's September, I think it's tomorrow actually. So you could go on and not and do a nominate. All I, we ask is that you're very specific so that, the, you know, don't assume we know who you're nominating and how great this person is. Um, the more we have, uh, the more information we have, the better it is for us to make that decision uh, because it, we, they, we have a whole, a whole committee and the team will make that decision. But, um, but uh, you know, we have such powerful, strong women in our community. Why not nominate uh, someone and, and recognize them? Thank you. Thank you for that update. Talking about strong women in our community, how about asking Bonnie to tell us about Sustainable Connecticut and where we are? Okay, there you go. Are you there, Bonnie? Yeah. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Can you hear me? Sure. Okay, we submitted our proposal um, for the certification, bronze certification. It was an amazing learning experience, I will tell you that. And it was very exciting and difficult during COVID because you couldn't meet with people. But um, we were able to put a lot of stuff on the town website, which is great um, for mobility, for seniors, for them to get around. Um, the watershed, the Farm River watershed has opened up all kinds of opportunities. And um, 
I just finished a stream walk, which is part of our citizen science education aspect of the Farm River. Um, and um, all of the energy stuff with municipal buildings and hopefully the next round will be with the solar. Um, there, the thing that's uh, the answer, whether we completed it properly will be in November. Um, we use the Sunflower Project a lot, the Pollinator Pathway and the Sunflower Project. And um, if anybody has any questions about anything, I'm happy to answer them. It's very broad. It has to do with um, local businesses, land use, um, and it has been extremely exciting. And if anybody is interested in learning more or volunteering, please contact us. Because the next level is the silver level, right? Correct. And the difference between some of the things that we'll be doing in the silver, uh, it's um, for the next level will be the watershed plan will be ready to submit. Um, and that's been, that's great. The other thing is we will have three equity projects and that will be a challenge, um, but we'll figure it out. Um, and if anybody wants to know more, I'm happy to um, tell them any more. Thanks, Bonnie. Can I just add a word, uh, Liz, to, sure. to Christine's comment? Um, We've got some exciting developments going on right now. Um, I can't get public about them, but the interesting thing is most of them are in Wallingford Electric Corridor. And I think that speaks a lot to the issue of the high rates of electricity we're paying, um, in, both in our case with United Illuminating. And I really encourage Christine, obviously Vin, and, and my good friend Norm Needleman here in Essex, to keep working on that because the energy cost is a major problem for economic development. Thank you, Roger. Um, so just a little bit uh, in the future. So November 17th, we are planning a breakfast. It may be a virtual again. Um, we don't know for sure. But at this point, we're saying, yes, it'll be a virtual breakfast. So um, it'll be another highlight of a state of the town address. And um, is that when Kelly will be speaking? We think Roger? so. Uh, yep. Kelly and, and also um, Richard Dupont, who is the director of Housatonic College, who have okay. developed some advanced manufacturing programs. So he will okay. be joining us as well. All right. I'd like to speak to the issue of, issue of Rich. I mean, I'm really glad you brought him on board. He is um, he crosses the line between the schools, the trade schools, secondary schools, the colleges, the workforce boards, and 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 also NHMA, which is now manufacturing CT. And he just relocated his business and his his life here to the shoreline from Litchfield County. So it's a, it's a really great timing, Roger, to bring him on board. And you're going to love him. <laughs> Thank you, Marcia. That's okay, awesome. about loving it. I'm having a conversation with a French company who are the leading manufacturers of high-tech batteries for NASA and for aerospace. And their broker is working with me in French. So here we are in North Bramford attracting a company from France. We'll see how it works out. Very good. Very good. Uh, also, one other thing, uh, the week of October 11th to 17th is the Science Week. And we are putting together some activities uh, through the local libraries um, and uh, also through education. So be on the lookout for that through Constant Contact and on uh, North Branford Community Pride. And um, and that's all I've got. Uh, you know, I just, again, want to thank everyone for the call today. Uh, we really are missing having our big event under the big tent as our, you know, the POCO folks having missed that this year. 
but this is the world we're living in and it's very obvious to me by hearing people on this uh virtual meeting that everyone is doing the best they can and i think what something like this happens it causes people to really work together for mm -hmm. solutions whether it be personally for their businesses and that's what i'm hearing today in volumes and that we're able to work together as a community uh work through our state legislature legislators um our town manager our our town government to help everyone thrive in this in this uh time this difficult time and again we're here for you i don't know if roger or mike uh, or i don't know if mike lost his audio so i don't know if he can add anything but Roger, if you want to add anything else or any of the EDC members, uh, please feel free. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Hey, Liz, can I just make a quick comment? Sure. Um, a shout out to Marsha and her team. Um, although I'm not involved any longer with Guilford, but it's still in my heart. Uh, but if you're not familiar with some of their products, uh, come by the Guilford Green and or the parking lot behind the Whitfield and Water Street shops because Guilford, for one, proudly uses Marsh's Pen Globe light fixtures. So the green was updated a number of years ago. Uh, frankly, I wasn't involved in any of that, so I can't take credit, but I probably will anyhow. Um, but, you know, we, uh, we used their light fixtures on the Guilford green. And then when we got into a renovation of the parking lot uh, behind the Whitfield and Water Street shops, we wanted to carry that feel uh, from the green over into the parking lot. And we came back to Penn Globe and asked them to work with us and put together. And I, I can't remember the exact number. It's probably 13 to 15 fixtures in the back parking lot. But one of the things, you look at what's in the, in the, on the green itself, they're a little lower and that's the style that's used in park-like settings and the ones in the back of the parking are a little bit higher to give a broader a light coverage uh, around and you know keeping the parking lot uh, safe. And uh, again, uh, work with them well, and we had a couple of tweaks that were needed um, and, and minor things, but uh, Marsh and her team jumped through hoops and, and helped us make that a successful project. So I welcome any of you to come by the green or the parking lot and you'll see some of their products in action. Oh, that's very kind of you, Brian. I want to tell you guys a quick success story about just the, the, the human spirit really quickly. I think many of you know that we launched a, a program back in the fall pre-COVID where we make $500 food pantry donations to locations where our customers are. So Westchester County, Austin, Cambridge, Nantucket, um, we just did a, a, a project up at UConn, another project at UConn, and uh, so I didn't do stores. I went to the backyard of the electrical contractor on the job for UConn, which is up in Waterford, and um, it, it worked just like we wanted it to do. She is also making a donation. So, like, these things have, like, legs and, and, and power, you know, to to do it. So, I mean, I'm proud of our company because we all wanted to do it before there was COVID, but it's nice to see the business community, you know, giving back across the board. So I just wanted to tell you, it's really good people out there. So just saying, thanks. Thank you. So with that being said, um, no other questions. Again, we're here for you. Reach out to us, reach out to Mike, reach out to Roger. Thank you so much for everyone attending today. Thank you, Marsha, uh, for your great insight onto your company and also what's happening at the state as far as manufacturing and skill-based skill building. And we're hoping that that continues to be a theme because that is, is so important. When I first learned about the shortage of manufacturing jobs a few years ago that we had in our state, um, we want to keep we want to keep young people here to continue that that pipeline growing because we have a viable state or an excellent state and we want to see that that growth. So thank you again. Thank you for everyone's attendance. Stay safe. Stay well. Again, uh, Roger, if you want to add anything before we conclude, please feel free to do so. No, thank you. All. Thank you, Liz, for putting this together. Much appreciated. Great. All right.